So it is 11 o'clock in the UK, and so welcome to the, to the webinar, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Kenny Whitler-Jones, and this morning we're going to be talking about the situation in Ukraine and the impact on uh, gas supply in Europe. Um, this is our first time doing one of these webinars using Google Hangouts, so uh, so bear with us a little bit if it's a, it's a little bit clunky. Um, we're going to be uh, plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the, the webinar, um, so go ahead and ask questions as we go through. Um, you can use the Q&A panel on the Google Hangout. You can, uh, if you're on Twitter, if you want to ask questions on Twitter, just direct them to uh, at F1F9, um, and we'll circle back at the end and try and gather up some of those questions. Um, so you're all, all very welcome. We're going to keep this webinar to an hour in length, um, and we're going to get right into the discussion. I'm really pleased to be uh, joined by uh, Yvonne and Danny, um, Yvonne Barton, who's uh, joining us from Rome. Um, Yvonne is an LNG import terminal specialist, um, a, a long and distinguished career, beginning with, uh, with BP. Um, she's president of BG in Italy um, and has worked a lot with the European Commission and various others around LNG import issues. So Yvonne, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, we also have Danny Prinsloo, um, who runs the Energy and Natural Resources uh, modeling team at F1F9. Um, he teaches uh, oil and gas financial modeling course for F1F9 and, and, and runs that, that modeling team. So a dedicated team of modelers um, um, looking at, at financial modeling uh, in, in, the, in the energy and natural resources sector. He's also published several e-books uh, around oil and gas modeling issues. And after the webinar, we'll send out uh, some links to those to those e-books for those of you who haven't already downloaded them. I know some of you joining this webinar have already are familiar with Danny's work, and some of you are joining F1F9 for the first time. So uh, you're all very uh, very welcome. So I'm going to get straight into it. As I say, we're going to keep this to an hour. If there are more questions than we can handle in that hour, what we'll do is we'll follow up with a blog post and address some of the questions we couldn't get to. But we're going to we're going to stick to the hour in length and and respect everybody's everybody's time. So. Um, Perhaps, Yvonne, if I could, if I could ask the first question and, and, and kick off our uh, discussion, um, it, it, the, the numbers I have, uh, EU supplies about a third, um, sorry, Russia supplies about a third of, of EU gas, and so clearly that's a, a, a political issue um, and, 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 and must be one of the drivers for investment in gas infrastructure. Can we, can we kick off the discussion by you perhaps giving us an overview of the current market dynamics about how Russian gas fits into the, the supply mix in, in the EU? Yes, I think, um, thank you Kenny, the, the first thing to do is to look at um, the European continent in, in two halves because Western Europe and Eastern Europe have very different dynamics. In Western Europe since the financial crisis of 2008 um, energy consumption has been uh, essentially declining but the gas sector itself has been under particular attack, firstly because the uh, European Commission is promoting renewables, which of course are subsidised, and um, uh, gas is struggling to cope in the power sector, um, but secondly because of coal. Um, in North America, shale gas is essentially uh, driving out coal from the power generation sector and uh, American industry was very reliant on coal and now it's switching to gas so the coal has got to go somewhere and we've been getting essentially, a, um, well tidal wave is probably a, a, a bad metaphor of uh, cheap supplies, boatloads of coal coming to Western Europe um, which are being burned in European power stations instead of gas which considering that the objective of the European Union is to reduce carbon emissions, this is something of a paradox but it does mean, though, that um, gas demand in Western Europe has been absolutely tanking in the last few years, and um, it's um, uh, a, a cause of great distress to the industry, and of course, gas-fired power stations are closing. Um, the outlook for demand for gas in Western Europe, even notwithstanding the coal problem, um, is certainly that um, gas demand is not going to recover even to 2008 uh, uh, levels, and not even 2010 levels, but at least another 10 years. The International Energy Agency is referring to this as a, uh, a lost decade in energy demand, and it's quite possible that we'll never see those historical levels ever again. So you would think, you know, that the, the outlook for, for gas supplies is pretty blooming. 
On the other hand, though, um, a lot of our gas supply in, in Western Europe does come from our own production. But that's not going to go on for very much longer. Um, the UK is in steep decline, and although there's a little bit of a hiatus at the moment with um, uh, government incentives uh, promoting um, marginal fuel development, um, Norway is on plateau. We don't think the Norwegian uh, level of um, uh, delivery to Western Europe will be sustained beyond about 2021, 20, 22. Um, and the other big surprise uh, that happened um, not that long ago, a few months back, was the discovery that the Groningen field in the Netherlands has got some very serious problems. Groningen was the first big gas discovery in Western Europe back in the 1960s. In fact, it was what gave rise to the whole North Sea gas uh, industry. And has been producing, we thought, happily for you know, around 50 years until the people in the town of Groningen found that their houses were shaking and the earthquakes that the uh, depletion of the field is causing means that they're going to have to cut back on production quite substantially. So the outlook for domestic production in, in Western Europe means that um, uh, we're going to have to in increase the amount of gas we import in the coming years, uh, despite the fact that demand is on, on a decrease. Now, Who's going to provide those new imports? Well, of course, Russia has been a major supplier to Western Europe now since the early 1970s. It's been a very reliable supplier. All through the Cold War, we never had any problems with them at all. Um, Russian share of gas supply did come under pressure in the immediate um, uh, wake of the financial crisis. Um, at that time, prices fell. There was an upsurge in uh, cheap LNG coming in from the Middle East and um, uh, hub trading uh, increased dramatically to try and account for the oversupply. Norway was very canny, they managed to price themselves into that position and they, uh, Norwegian supplies, if anything, increased, they kept their market share. So Russia actually lost a lot of market share in the sort of 2009-2012 timeframe. And um, Russia since then has been renegotiating its prices and in in some way finding its way back into the marketplace. So Russia is well, down for a bit, but certainly not out. And by last year, we'd seen them claw back a terrific amount of market share for two reasons. Firstly, because they'd really wish they could price it. But secondly, because most countries in Western Europe have very onerous long-term contracts with, with Russia. Um, Italy, Germany, France, their contracts go out way past 2030. And these long-term contracts have take-or-pay clauses, which require the buyer to use 80% uh, of the contract quantity. Or if they don't, they have to pay for it. Now, at the end of last year, um, Italy v and I had actually amassed 2 billion euros of payments that it made for gas that it couldn't use. And this is quite a serious problem. Now, it's a problem for both parties. It's a problem for E&I. And it's also a problem for Gazprom. Um, because, you know, this is um, a business that is going to have to be unwound at some stage. And also, they can't put that on the books as profits. So, um, uh, in the earlier part of this year, Italian industry negotiated a, a holiday from the table pay with Algeria so that they could make up some of the shortfall with, with Russia. And uh, they, they got a, a 10 BCM holiday there. So, you know, this is quite a big, these are big numbers we're talking about. I mean, Russia is not going away as a, as a supplier. You know, 20 years on, they'll still be here. Um, in the meantime, also, we've seen uh, LNG going uh, to the Far East. Um, the Fukushima incident in April 2011 uh, caused a, a major upswing in, in requirements for LNG in the Far East. And as a result, uh, LNG uh, deliveries into Western Europe have diminished uh, very noticeably. Um, whether that's going to continue through this winter, as LNG prices have also softened, and we can talk about that a bit later if you like, but at the moment it's possible that some LNG will, will find its way back. But essentially, Russia is the main swing supplier into, into Europe right now. Um, LNG isn't um, isn't providing that alternative, and it certainly isn't price attractive. Eastern Europe's a very different story. Um, the countries that joined the EU relatively recently, um, the Balk Balkans and the Baltic and so on, um, a lot of those countries are completely reliant on Russia for their supply. Uh, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, uh, um, 
Bulgaria, oh, and all down the Balkans, those countries are completely reliant and they have no alternatives. And so the EU is, is having to, to look at how they provide uh, alternative infrastructure. Um, but um, at the same time, most of those countries are in themselves seeing a major decrease in their gas requirements. The Soviet era industries, which were burning uh, almost uh, zero crop gas, um, that uh, allow those industries to keep going, of course, have now had to be dismantled. And so we've seen a, a, a essentially a collapse in, in energy demand, not mine with gas demand, in most of the, the Eastern Bloc. The Ukraine, though, is for them a the problem. Um, in the um, uh, southeast part of, of uh, the European Union, um, Bulgaria, Austria, Italy, uh, all of these countries rely totally on the Ukraine for transit of, of gas. Uh, Germany has the advantage nowadays of Nord Stream, and they're able to diversify to a certain extent. And the pipeline that goes through the Belarus, which is, shall we say, less contentious than Ukraine, but there have been, shall we say, um, uh, moments for concern even there. Um, but uh, Italy, Bulgaria, and Slovenia, if you put together what they brought through Ukraine and the fact that they're completely reliant on the supply uh, in, in 2013, it accounts for 40 BCM on Russian supply. So it's a very serious um, um, constraint on the um, uh, energy position of the southern and eastern Europe. I mean, a, 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 a fantastic and, and, and comprehensive kind of overview of the dynamics and the, and the role of, of, of Russia in, in, in Europe's gas supply. Could, could you speak a little bit or tell us a little bit about the, um, some of the challenges for investors in gas infrastructure at the moment? Um, Kenny, yes. I mean, I think a lot of these, these points, you know, uh, Yvonne has touched it, but, but one of the key, key things for investors is is currently the economic downturn. Mm. Um, if I'm going to invest in in infrastructure, um, you know, import terminal or a pipeline, I do want to have the the confidence that at least you know someone is going to 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 offtake the gas at the back end. Mm -hmm. That's really where where there's a challenge that we currently see in in, in the European market. As Yvonne said, you know the, the the projections today isn't an increase in uh, demand. It's very stable, and there might be be even slightly a decrease. Mm -hmm. um, you're also competing with alternative energy supply. The the cheap coal coming in. And there's a big drive in, in Europe for, for investments in renewables. Now, you start creating this gap, you know, or growth, and that's just any growth you start eating up through, you know, investment of renewables, alternative fuels. And one of the other things as well that links to this, and this is the, the, the EU long-term energy policies. Um, it's to do with, you know, where does the EU stand with diversification of supply, um, security of supply? Are, are they going to, you know, we heard some announcements last week about investment packages being made available in, in Europe for, for infrastructure development, but energy was mentioned among another group of um, you know sectors that will receive funding without going into the specifics so also want to understand that and as, as, as Yvonne also further said you know the, the whole issue about you competing also import of LG for example Asia. Um, Asia is currently providing higher prices than Europe about 25 percent higher than than prices coming into Europe um, and you know Russia. If you talk, take the Russia uh, factor. Um, they also know, you know, what what is the cost of bringing in LNG, and therefore they can also play around their own pricing mechanisms, just to be a, a bit cheaper than than LNG. And we've we've typically seen this recently in the press with Lithuania, that's that's um, received investment and in the to building an import terminal FSRU. Um, and the announcement was made, you know, it's it's resulted in Russia dropping its prices by 20%. Um, so they do sit now with a terminal infrastructure 
but it's not that fully utilized because Russia also is saying, well, you know, all we need to do is to drop the prices. So, in summary, as an investor, you, you would like to have that certainty of the end market. Um, if I'm going to spend X million, I want to know I'm going to re retrieve some sort of return on my investment. So, so Danny, just to continue on that theme, I mean, if I wasn't uh, looking at the can continue to look at the investor perspective, um, a, a new, and you talk about a new LNG import terminal. What does that add to the cost of LNG? What are the, what are the economics around that? Oh. Um, Kenny, I'm going to use this as a, as a case, and uh, you know, and let's let's take the currently, you know, when p people talk about import terminals uh, into Europe to bring in LNG, you know. Currently, the preference is to, to construct a, a, a FSRU or a floating storage regas unit. So this is a big vessel um, that you move, it's stationary, and you use it as a, a storage facility and regasification facility. Now, one of the things that if you, if you typically talk about these vessels, new vessels, in, in size, you know, it's it's about a, a 177,000 type of cubic meter vessel, and that equates roughly to about four BCM per year of of um, export. Now, what people need to realize, and this this I always caution when we talk about capital cost, what what does a vessel like this cost? You must realize that it's not only the cost of the vessel it's one portion there's the mooring you might have to construct a pipeline to get to the grid um, there is still land facilities there's owners cost in terms of um, you know all the engineering work recruitment of people etc so you know if we talk about a, a capi cap capital cost for FSRU unit you know you can probably work around 440 million roughly um, as as an estimate, you know, and and it can go as high as 660 type of 650 million euros, and that's very dependent on on what is already existing and what needs to be constructed, how far you are from the the grid, you know. Uh, so that that gives you an idea of the capital cost. If you talk about operating costs, you know, this also again varies. Or can you tie into existing operations that's that's close by? If not, you're probably talking in the region of 12 to 18 million dollars per year of running one of these vessels. Um, so, if this is my operating cost, you know, my my capital cost of about 4, 440 to 500 million euros, and if I'm an investor, you know, these are let's call it utility type returns. They in our infrastructure. You're looking at a six, maybe to eight percent type of return on on investing in one of these vessels. Now, that equates to adding about a dollar fifty to two dollar twenties per MMBTU to to your gas price. Um, so suddenly you start saying, well, actually now if that's that is it, how how does that actually fit in into the European pricing, you know, mechanism? And and you can think about this. If, if 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 the 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 price in Europe, you know, is about ten ten dollars per MMBTU, and and let's say you need to subtract about a dollar for connection fees, transportation on the pipeline side, you then subtract another two dollars, um, you know, for the re regasification facility, that gives you about seven dollars per MMBTU. That you need to land or deliver LNG, you know, in Europe, and then then you start asking yourself, well, let's let's say where's contentious. Let's say we look at um, the U.S. and suddenly we go to the U.S. and we say, well, actually, Henry, our price is about 450. You know, that needs to go through a liquefaction process. Um, there's logistics that needed added added to that to get it to Europe. And, and suddenly you are really in a squeeze. So, you know, as an investor in infrastructure in Europe, you are going to cons be concerned and saying, well, if I've invested in this facility, is it going to be used? Who's going to use it? Um, because I'm competing with Asia. The, the market pricing doesn't support currently um, bringing in LNG. 
Now, this is a topic for the, you know for another discussion, but this is really where the dynamics, I think, in the European pricing volume is is going to see. We're going to see a lot of volatility in the future, a lot of changes, and and it might even happen with a lot of LNG capacity coming online that Europe might become a dumping ground for excess capacity for LNG because you must remember with LNG. Um, you don't just switch off these facilities. They they not on and off switches. Yes, you can turn down so, a bit, bit in terms of production, but these facilities need to keep running. And also, a lot of the time, the, there's also condensates liquids produced with the gas. That also has a value. So, I do think you know maybe for another time, it is a really interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is around ten dollars per mm BTU. European prices, it is marginal for bringing in LNG. Mm, yeah. So it sounds like the market dynamics make it not attractive to invest in that infrastructure, but it sounds like we need that infrastructure. So, so um, Yvonne, maybe I could, I could ask you to, to, to you know, what, what, what happens next? How can that, how can that uh, investment, how can the security of supply be incentivized? What mechanisms are available? Yes, exactly. It's a very um, uh, tricky situation because the European Commission is at the same time requiring us to uh, convert to a low carbon economy at the same time as um, uh, the regulations that the EC has issued uh, are quite clear about the security supply level that we need. And um, the principle that the EC sets out is what's known as the N-1. And where N is the number of import or uh, supply points in a particular country, um, and N minus one, so if, if the biggest single supply of um, or infrastructure coming into your country or your region was to fail, how are you going to cope? And uh, coping means either um, being able to supply on a day of um, a one in twenty year extreme event of, of weather or uh, a 120 emergency, shall we say, um, or 30 days under average uh, winter conditions for, in terms of European countries. So, what that means is, if you are in uh, Italy, for example, it means that the tank pipeline from uh, Austria that brings the, the gas from guess where Ukraine is the is the N minus one test, and that um, uh, that pipeline. Has capacities around 30, uh, 39 BCM per annum, so it's a huge thing. And in order to satisfy the N minus one criteria, not only is the government having to uh, see ways to improve storage and particularly not the capacity of storage, but the standard rates of storage, but also they're looking to um, incentivize the construction of new LNG import terminals. They need at least eight BCM extra capacity. They say and um, maybe even 16, which is all very well, but we have two terminals in Italy at the moment who haven't seen a, an LNG cargo in two years. The, the pricing of LNG versus the local pricing of gas just doesn't, just doesn't justify it. Um, in, in the UK, um, the single biggest um, uh, infrastructure is in fact, believe it or not, not the Norwegian infrastructure, but the, uh, the pipeline that brings the gas from the LNG terminals in Wales into the centre of the country. So in the UK, it's a much easier calculation. LNG just doesn't form such a big part of the energy mix. And so the UK can get away with having um, essentially very little strategic plan for, for energy security. But for Southern and Eastern Europe, um, these investments are, are crucial. Um, the, uh, the example of Lithuania that um, Dani just mentioned is, is a very good um, case in point, and we will see more of those, I think. Um, the tunnel in, that's planned in Croatia is designed to complement the one in Lithuania, but it has to be paid for. Yeah. If, 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 if I can pause for a second in our discussion, I'd like to remind people how they can ask questions. Um, some people have are, are finding it difficult to ask without being logged into Google. I think Google's got a thing going on where you are trying to force people to log in. So you can ask questions. If you want to email questions, just email them straight to support at f1f9.com if you've got questions for Yvonne or Danny. Um, um, or you can, if you can log into the, the Google platform, you can ask them straight on the Q&A pane there. 
uh, or on the on on the YouTube page with it, wherever wherever you're viewing this, um, or on Twitter at F1F9. So um, I think uh, for those of you not managing to do it through through Google, perhaps uh, fire in your questions by email to support at F1F9.com. Yvonne, it, it it looks like. You know, it looks like this, the appetite from the private sector may not be there. So, what what approaches are regulators and governments taking to to finance these these developments? Well, I think um, the European Commission has uh, well, uh, they've already made it clear that they need to see these projects happening. And um, there's some quite complicated, uh, one might say, um, uh, virtual financing arrangements going on. But essentially, there's there's three or four different ways you can approach the problem as to who ultimately pays. And I suppose, firstly, you could say um, we could pay all of us, the whole society, in which case um, the government would subsidize the project. And that's essentially what's happening in Lithuania. They're getting a, a cheap loan through the uh, European Investment Bank. Um, and uh, in, in Hungary, they have a, a major strategic storage um, service, which has been put there at the instigation of government and is being paid for. Um, uh, uh, were constructed with, with um, central funds. Um, you could otherwise, though, actually go to individual companies and say, "Look, you know, we will incentivize you to um, get on and do this project." And that's how exploration and production is is is, is financed. The fiscal terms for drilling in the North Sea um, dictate whether or not the, the companies go out and do it. And that again is paid for by taxation. We all pay for that um, ultimately, mm -hmm. um, whether it's at an EU level or it's at a country level. Um, getting down though to the, the question of actually who benefits though, then the um, the question of getting only gas users to pay or gas providers to pay um, is what tended to be called socialisation and. Um, certainly in, in um, uh, Spain and Greece, the cost of LNG terminals, which are surplus to normal requirements, but they are therefore a strategic role, those are uh, paid for out of the, um, the transmission tariff, which is increased uh, in order to uh, give a, an extra um, um, uh, subsidy to the developers of this key infrastructure. And it's the government who decides who builds the terminals and decides also what they get to be paid. But it's the whole of the gas-consuming um, society within the country that pays pro rata to its consumption through the transmission uh, tariff they pay for shipping the gas. So it's a, a complicated way of making sure that um, the person that consumes more pays more. But the, the other way of looking at it is to say, well, actually, if there's a major emergency, the people who are most likely to need that benefit are people who have very little choice in, in, in their sort of supply. A power station, you could say, oh, well, look, you ought to have a storage tank full of diesel and use that in an emergency. In, in your own home or in a hospital or in a, a place where people are vulnerable and have very few ways of switching supplies, um, then we also have a responsibility, a social responsibility, and that consumer group, probably also because the distribution networks are much more sensitive, if there's a shortage of gas, um, uh, the safety of the network is at risk. You, you, uh, it's a, it isn't just that the flow gets low, it's also it's that oxygen gets in and the whole thing becomes uh, potentially um, um, very dangerous. So in France, for example, um, if you're a supplier to households, to residential customers, you are by law required to keep a certain amount of gas in storage mm -hmm. and to maintain that storage level throughout the winter. And the cost of doing so gets passed on to the, the customer through his regulated bill that he gets in, in, in the post. Um, there it's very much focused on who benefits and um, on that very specific uh, consumer group, so household is paid. Um, um, in the case of the uh, Lithuanian project, ultimately, um, all uh, in that particular one, all, all consumers in, in Lithuania will pay through the transmission tariff. Um, so it's a question of who do you think is um, most uh, well positioned to take on this uh, on this uh, financial burden? An interesting mix of of approaches being taken by different different countries. Um, 
Danny, we're, we're kind of hitting that, that the half hour mark, and I want to kind of wrap up the discussion part of it, the initial discussion part of it, so that we've got some time to, um, to tackle some of the questions that are coming in. Um, but before we do that, um, you know, Russia and China recently signed a, a supply agreement, a contract on, on, on gas supply. Any last thoughts on what you think the impact of that might be on the European um, uh, security of supply dynamics? Um, Kenny, yes. Um, Russia did sign sign an agreement with China. There was actually two two deals. The one is a firm deal. The other one is more of a let's call it a, a cooperation uh, a study. They still need to look at it. Um, talking about the first one, that's much more firm supply agreement. Um, what is interesting that people need to realize is that the those the gas supplied will come from new fields, fields that is not supplying the EU. So they it will not, in the short term, be an impact on the EU. Now Russia is talking with China on the second one. That's a Western Bypass pipeline. Now that will will be supplied from the same fields that's supplying Europe. Um, having said that, one must also realize that. Early indications at this point in time looks like the the net back prices Russia will receive out of China is going to be less than 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 what they're getting out of Europe. You know, it's longer distances. You must also realize these are new investments, new capital that needs to be spent, and, and therefore I don't totally see you know Russia suddenly saying, well, we we're not going to supply, we're going to divert to to China. Um, I think Russia also is taking a longer term view like and realizing look they are also competing with other sources in in Europe um, and therefore as the economy is very much linked to gas and oil they need to say how do we grow this who else is there and we know China you know is also a growing economy they are looking for for energy so You'll, you'll probably see a supply into China, but that doesn't necessarily re relate to a, and now we're going to reduce supply into Europe. I don't think people should, should necessarily link, link those two directly with each other. Um, so, you know, and as I said, you know, the, 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 the key thing is um, early analysis is that it doesn't look like Russia will be getting the same net back prices, you know. Uh, the Chinese do dri drive a hard deal. To negotiate with them, it's longer distances, so there's more losses um, in the process. It's new development, so there's a lot of challenges for for that projects to come off ground. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they will happen. Question of of when. Great. Well, thank you both for that kind of initial um, overview of the situation and kind of you know some 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 good detail on the market dynamics and the and the, and the investment uh, outlook. Um, we've had a couple of questions that I just want to circle back to. I think most of you will be able to see that on your on your uh, Google Hangout interface. But just in case, I'm going to read some of these questions. So I'm going to start with Alex Colton, who's asked a couple of questions. He's saying, it sounds like the economic case for strategic infrastructure does not exist based on a price arbitrage. Um, 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 Yvonne, do you have either of you have a comment on that? I think it's reiterating what we've said, really. Yes, it is, and the, um, uh, the case for storage in the UK was investigated very much in detail two years ago, because as you say, um, if you look at the, the valuation of storage um, on, a, on, a, um, on an intrinsic value, normally uh, the storage developer is looking at the difference between a winter price and a summer price to be able to justify um, the, the, the capacity and the, the keeping that commodity in store. Um, those signals have got, if anything, weaker over over time. The the winter summer price spread in, in the UK is is going is getting tighter and tighter. And so the um, the government actually did address two years ago should they intervene and insist that there was strategic storage because um, there was no question that it could be justified on a market basis. And in the end, they came to the conclusion that it was better to use other market tests to, uh, to ensure that the, um, the supplies came from elsewhere and um, the UK is very, has a, a terrifically diversified uh, pool of sources. But I, I think in a, you know, in a couple of years time they'll have to review that again because the, the, the balance of supply and demand is shifting 
and um, particularly as the, uh, the need for needle peak when um, renewables are intermittent. That doesn't get fully factored into the pricing. It's very hard to see how that works. So I think the, the, um, there will be mechanisms for stimulating uh, rapid, rapid cycle or rapid response storage in the, in, in the near future. But at the moment, it's hard to know how you actually get to those figures. Because we need it. You know, yeah. to keep the lights on, you have to have these resources. Yeah, yeah. Can I can add to that? You know, if you talk about the price arbitrage, you know, and and so on, it, it's also a question of what's what's your view of long term prices is going to be in Europe, and and you know, all indications are you know, if you are talking about a price around the ten dollars premium BTU, I I I do think it is going to be marginal. If you have a view, it's going to be much higher than then you know. It might make sense if you think it's going to be lower. You know, you might not go down that route. Mm -hmm. Good, Alex. Please feel free to come back on that if you have other other points to add. Alex goes on with a, with a follow up question about what about the risk of risk caused caused by car decarbonisation? Um, um, he says, might sub-Saharan African exporters. Nigeria, Angola, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, so, sorry, I'm reading the wrong question, my apologies. He said, well, the, the risk posed by decarbonization with two dimensions, carbon bubble and the risk of stranded assets and the decrease in demand for gas linked to increased capacity and energy efficiency. Uh, Danny, any, any, any thoughts on that, on the, on the issue of decarbonization? Yeah, I, it, it, it's quite a topic. I think there, there's a couple of factors you, you need to think about uh, that. The, the one is, you know, what what's happening with legislation. So there's a legislation aspect to it. Uh, the whole carbon trading we, we've seen in Europe, it's not working. Um, you know, carbon credits, there's the oversupply, the pricing prices isn't picking up. Um, also, what is very interesting these days, the discussions I've involved is just saying, you know, if you talk about the current sharp decline of oil prices and, and you start thinking about, well, if this is maintained at a level of around $80 um, in that region, then, then suddenly, you know, people are going to start using more oil. You know, it, it starts competing against um, other alternatives. You know, renewables might be the green side to it, but, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people still look at the financial bottom line. Not saying that's right, but so there is also with lower oil prices, you are going to see again, you know, a swift of higher demand maybe it, because it becomes cheaper, it starts competing with, with other alternatives. So I'm, I'm not sure, Yvonne, if you've got some comments to it. Yes, it, it, it's, it's like the coal um, uh, conundrum, isn't it? You know, the, the market, irrespective, um, goes to where it, it is the economic um, uh, imperative. Um, and you know, Germany is dismantling its nuclear fleet at the same time as coal consumption is rocketing. Um, there's something very seriously wrong with that, and we don't have the mechanisms to impose a, a different trajectory right now. Okay. I said, Alex, thank you for those questions. Those are, those are great questions, and, and please feel free to come back with your own, with your own comment. Um, uh, Stefan um, is asking, uh, given the issues regarding European gas supply, might sub-Saharan African exporters, and this is the question I started reading a part of last time, so apologies <laughs> for that confusion, um, uh, might sub-Saharan African exporters uh, play a more important role supplying gas to Europe in the near future. Yvonne, do you want, do you want to pick that one up? No, by Sub-Saharan, uh, presumably this means Mozambique and Tanzania. Yes, yeah, well, Stefan's saying uh, Nigeria, Angola, Mozambique. <laughs> well, Angola, of course, has got its problems at the moment, but uh, should be up and running again in a year or so. Um, so uh, Angola, though, is, is better placed to supply the um, um, up-and-coming uh, countries which are, are, are um, who, whose gas demand is, is growing very fast in uh, Argentina, Brazil and Chile because if you look at the geographic location of, of, Moza, of um, Angola. Um, uh, Nigeria, of course, has been supplying Western Europe for, um, what, 15 years now very successfully uh, with LNG on a regular basis. So, yes, um, uh, the problems with, politically with um, Nigeria and expanding that export capabilities are evidenced by the fact that many international companies have switched their attentions to East Africa 
And that's why, essentially, the, the new plague in Mozambique and Tanzania had come to the fore, um, uh, exasperation with, with West Africa. And um, Mozambique is, is making great strides forward, but I doubt that we'll see any LNG coming out of there before 2020. I, I would have thought 2022 is more like the time frame. Um, there's also, of course, always the, um, the uh, conversation that people like to have about bringing the um, pipeline from uh, Nigeria up through um, Sub-Saharan Africa and through Algeria and up into Southern Europe that way. Um, somehow I don't think it's ever going to quite get there, but it's, it's been around as a concept for some time. Um, Kenny, just on, on the, the, the East Africa one, it's always an interesting one, the Tanzania-Mozambique um, one. And as Yvonne said, if you look at the timeline there, and I, I want to actually be a bit more conservative than Yvonne and say I, I don't think that given where there are the time durations that, that we're going to see any LNG until 2024, 25 um, what one must also realize is that, you know, there's a lot of capacity that's coming up in, in Australia. You know, the Gorgon project, the Wheatstone project, uh, Pluto, and so on. So, you know, let's take just Gorgon. Gorgon is doing three trains. They've already got space alloc allocated for two additional trains. So these facilities in Australia is coming on online in the next two to three years. Um, they will be producing. So suddenly you talk about East Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania competing potentially with expansions out of Australia. So these, these facilities, so, so now you're talking about greenfields economics versus expansion economics. Um, you look at the distance wise, you look at everything, you know, I, it, it is really going to be a tough one. I think this, this still, you must think about both those countries. They still need quite a bit of investment in infrastructure, you know, things, basic things, accommodation, uh, skilled labor engineers um, running these facilities. So, so Tanzania and, and Mozambique, I think they, they're still a bit behind um, and they will be competing with, with uh, supply out of Australia. Uh, in the future, you know. So, and and don't yes, there's there's Middle East as well. You know, the in Iraq, specifically in the South Basra, those areas, they're looking at at, at putting up LNG. So there's potentially LNG, more LNG coming out there as well mm. out of the Middle East. So it is going to be quite a dy dynamic um, situation in in the future. Yeah, yeah. Good. Talking talking of dynamic situations, one of our uh, one of our team here has just uh, shown me the uh, breaking news about an accident at a nuclear power station in Ukraine. Um, um, so uh, some uh, some increased dynamics to throw into the mix <laughs> live as we're on air. So um, uh, yeah, gosh, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously find out what that's all about after after this. But mm, not uh, good. Not good. Not good. So I think that, that, that wraps up the questions that we that we have, um, um, and so I think it leaves me to to, to just wrap up the discussion. Say to, to thank you to, to both of you for for your time today to to explore this issue, a really interesting issue, a very uh, uh, um, a live and uh, important issue for, for for European energy supply. Um, um, we've got uh, we've got time for one more question, which we've just received um, um, before we wrap it up. Um, Alex again is asking, say, regarding the deployment and demand reduction, will, will it have a deflationary impact of fossil fuel prices? It's not clear how much of an impact. The long-term demand for gas will also be dependent on, on CCS. Are these risks currently considered in investment decisions? So we're talking about the, 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 the risks of deflationary impact of fossil fuel prices um, and the long-term demand for gas and, and dependence on, on CCS. So these. Uh, Danny or Yvonne, either of you, do, you, do you see these risks being currently taken into account in investment decisions? Um, in terms of CCS, I, it, I mean what we've seen recently is that uh, it is being taken in consideration in some of the work we've done. People are looking at it, they are putting a cost to it. We've, we've also recently done some, some modeling around that. Um, in pricing, um, you know, a lot of these prices do take supply demand in, they do take alternative factors in consideration. So it is built in, you know, there, there are, are companies that specialize in analyzing, you know, the, the fundamentals of supply uh, demand. 
and, and, and alternatives. So it is factored that in the interesting thing that we have seen is on the financial modeling side is people are starting to add that into to the analysis. So, so you're seeing that that is something that's being considered in, in, in investment it is, appraisals? It, it is being considered. I, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say everyone is considering it yet, mm -hmm. but we, we are picking it up more and more currently in terms of, of being, being built into the appraisal. Yeah. And that's perhaps a good good segue into, perhaps, Danny, you're just telling us a little bit, very briefly, we don't want a long, a long pitch, but what is it that the, the, the Energy and Natural Resources team at F1F9 does? What kind of modeling are you involved in, what kind of clients, what kind of support can you provide people with? Um, Kenny, yes, we we actually so, so, um, do modeling across the whole value chain. So it's upstream, midstream, stream. So so it goes right from from a upstream development that might be a PSA contract, PSC contract, right as as we talked about FSRU. We've done quite a few models on import terminals, the running of these import port terminals. Um, we do power plants, a lot of CCGTs, um, CHP plants. Um, so that is the, the, the spectrum across the value chain. But also what we do is, is supporting clients either during their contract negotiations, uh, you know, up front where they might be negotiating prices, doing the analysis, building the model at that end. Also to the other extreme, once once the facility is operational, we have also had a number of clients coming to us with contracts and then telling us, well, you know, at the end of the month we need to generate an invoice um, and you leave model, model, provide us with a model. Um, and, 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 and it's not that they've overseen it as part of the investment decision, but it's rather saying that, you know, when you are analyzing at that early phase, you might not model everything to the nth degree like uh, you know availability all of that stuff so these contracts has a lot of clauses and, and aspects like like take or pay shortfall etc and, and so on that needs to be modeled and, and we've we've also supported a number of some of the major companies oil and gas companies in providing these modeling support to them mm -hmm. so that's in a brief nutshell what we do uh, right. Kenny Right. And and next oil and oil and gas modeling course coming up in Houston, is it in February? Is that the, the, the that's the that's the plan day? that's the plan at this stage, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And Yvonne, as well as teaching, um uh, I believe you teach in, 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 in Rome, um uh, you're also involved in advisory work, is that right? Very much so. And the, the project we've just been talking about in Lithuania is, is uh, one of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, we, um, we did the um, market studies, the um, project structuring uh, together with Dani. We, we did a lot of that work for them, uh, essentially got the project off the ground. And I've recently been advising them on the, uh, the terminal use agreement whereby multiple uh, shippers can actually get access to the terminal in, in commercial as well as physical terms. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a complicated little project, but um, one that seems to be um, um, much more successful than we dared hope. Yeah. That yeah. Very pleasing. Right. And so, if people want to get hold of you, Yvonne, and, and uh, rent your brain, where, where can they where can they get where can they find you? Um, well, I, I'm I'm sure F1, F9 will forward any any inquiries. Right. Right. And we'll send around links as well uh, after this. So, following on from this, we'll send around links to some of Danny's uh, ebooks on on uh, oil and gas modeling specific issues. Um, which, if you're if you're active in modeling in this area, there's some good worked examples and so on. And also uh, links to where you can get hold of of Yvonne as well. So, um, I think I think we should call it a day there. Thank you both very much for your time. Thank you to everybody who's listened and uh, and to folks who've asked questions. And please, please feel free to follow up with questions if you have questions to Yvonne and Danny, and we can, uh, you know, we can we can reply afterwards, and we'll post those up on our on our blog. So, um, uh, we'll 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 wrap it up there, and we'll be in touch by email. So, thank you to everybody for joining us today. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks, thank Yvonne. You. Bye. Bye.